Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 48. Do you know the initial steps to get your Python script hosted on the web? You may have built something with Flask, but how would you stand it up so that you can share it with others? This week on the show, we have previous guest Martin Broyce. Martin shares his recent article titled Python Web Applications, Deploy Your Script as a Flask App. And David Amos is back, and he's brought another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. David shares a recent mathematical RealPython article about the stochastic gradient descent algorithm with Python. Stochastic gradient descent is an optimization algorithm, often used in machine learning applications to find ideal model parameters. We also cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including property-based testing with Hypothesis, Python's tug-of-war between beginner-friendly features and support for advanced users, how Python integers work, the Steering Council accepts PEP 634, a magical full-stack framework for Django named Django Unicorn, and a visual programming environment called Math Inspector. This episode is brought to you by Scout APM. Scout APM is application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues without dealing with the headache or overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me back. All right. This week, we got a good set of stuff, and I am going to do kind of a, a follow-up with Martin Broyce because he has a new article that just came out on Real Python titled Python Web Applications, Deploy Your Script as a Flask App. comes from an older Real Python article, which was kind of doing the same thing, but it's updating all the inner workings that have changed over the years since it originally was published. Yeah, You're basically getting a Flask app deployed on Google Cloud Platform. And so you need to install Google Cloud SDK and it walks you through all that, all those great details. So he'll be uh, visiting later on the episode. All right, so what do you got for your first one? First one I've got is called Property-Based Testing with Hypothesis and Associated Use Cases by Ying Wang. And I really enjoy the topic of, of testing code. It's something... I've never been like a, like a you know, software engineer in test or, or anything where like, I've been responsible for really maintaining a, a large test suite or anything. But as our listeners know, I do enjoy mathematics. And there's something similar to like testing software to the idea of like proving something in math- mathematics. It's like, you know, proving that your your code works the way it's intended to work and handles situations the way it's you know designed to to handle them. And uh, property-based testing is something that I find really, really fascinating. And Ying put together a really good introduction to what property-based testing is, how to do it in Python with the hypothesis package, and then also gets into some use cases and some like real-world examples of where this comes up. And so property-based testing is different from normal unit testing. So normally in, in unit testing, you would like provide an input to something, you know, some function that you're testing, say, and you would run that input through the function, get the the actual output back, and you know ahead of time, like what the expected output is supposed to be. You compare the actual output to the expected output, and if they're the same, then the test passes, and if they're different, then the test fails. So there's this like, you know, you know ahead of time, like what the input is, what the expected output is supposed to be, and things like that. So property-based testing is is different. Instead of knowing what the actual input is, you basically describe what the input is supposed to look like, like what properties it's supposed to have. And then under this assumption or under these constraints of what the properties are supposed to be, you generate a bunch of random data that has these properties and you see how your code responds to that data. 
when you put it into uh, to whatever you're you're testing. So it's a very different kind of paradigm, I guess, for uh, for testing. It sounds like it's it's giving you a broader scope of like what you're testing against and can kind of things that are different in the in the outside world with humans uh, right. approaching your your stuff. So yeah, exactly. It allows you to sort of account for the kind of randomness that you encounter in in real world situations. I mean, that's something that all software developers that have worked on on anything that's used by a large number of of people have experienced where they're like, wait, you're doing what with the program? Like that, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's not exactly to, you're not supposed right. to do that. But like I guess I you could use a think... knife as a screwdriver, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, you know, that's really kind of the, the idea behind this is it allows you to really, really simulate that, uh, that randomness. And you can, you can do things like you can just test, like what happens on, say, say you've built an API and you want to see like, you know, it has some parameters on some endpoint that it can take. And what happens when just garbage gets inputted uh, to those parameters, right? Like, and so you can, you can simulate that and, and it's in a, sort of non-deterministic way so each time you run your test there's there's going to be some some variations which could make things you know potentially a little bit flaky but but it can really expose you know where sort of the weak points are in your in your program or or uncover things that you just didn't even didn't even account for right all these little edge cases and stuff so so hypothesis is a tool in for doing property-based testing with python and he, he Ying walks through kind of an introduction to what, you know, hy- how hypothesis works. It's got sort of the, the backbone of it is this thing called a strategy, which is where you sort of define what the different properties are. So a strategy is like sort of defining this, like the shape of, of the input, okay. if you will. And, you know, talks a little bit about how you, how you build those. And then he works through some, some real world problems. So for example, a password validator. So if you have a function that's supposed to validate a password, you know, you could take sort of the, the unit test approach where you, you, you kind of come up with a list of, of different passwords and uh, whether or not, you know, true or false based on whether or not those should be, should pass the validation or not. But you don't really know whether or not you're, you're testing all the little edge cases in your, in your validator that way, because you just have this, you know, static set of passwords that you're you're using to to test. So the property based testing approach would say, well, I have a regular expression that I'm using as like this is what a valid password should be, right? Yeah. And you can use a hypothesis strategy to basically create random random strings that match the regular expression. And then it'll just generate these strings and then you can dump them into your uh, validation function and see if it validates as it's supposed to so rather than right so rather than having to create the passwords ahead of time it'll just create them for you and you can you know then you have a really good idea uh you can also tell it like how many times you want it to to test like how big that sample should be so you could test thousands of of strings that match this regular expression to really just hammer your your validation function and make sure that it's it's covering all the different uh, edge cases without having to even know what those edge cases might be. So it's a really powerful technique. The same thing with uh, you know testing a basic web app. I mean, what happens when a client tries to just throw a bunch of junk to to some endpoint on your on your web app on the server? So yeah, it's a really good introduction to it and gives you some good idea of like you know where this is used in the in the real world. It does not go into a whole lot of depth, so you're not going to walk away from this article like a hypothesis ninja or anything like that. But but it's a really good introduction to what property-based testing is and how you can use it to to really solidify and and bring a lot of, I guess, confidence to your, you know, that you, that your program works the way it's supposed to. Nice. That seems like the next step beyond those, like you said, the simple test cases that I've seen set up inside of like Django or something like that, where you're just really right. planning on, well, this is what humans should be doing with this thing, you know? <laughs> and so you're not really expecting all these different random kind of eh, potentially malicious things or just potentially random things that someone could do. Exactly. It might make things fall down. So that's great. Yeah. Last week I had 
Brett Cannon on the show and we talked a lot about syntax and we talked a lot about Python and the, all these kind of core elements. And we also in that conversation discussed the releases of Python. And since he's a core developer and on the Python steering council, we kind of, there's a couple of topics here that, that kind of are related to that in, in a couple of different ways. And the first one is by Andre Roberge and he has a blogger site called only Python. The title of it is Python's tug of war between beginner friendly features and support for advanced users. The premise of the article is really appreciating that Python has always been a friendly language. That's something we've talked about. Mm -hmm. In fact, in a lot of ways, the, the way it looks, the readability of it and so forth has always been one of the strong reasons that I was attracted to the language. And I think a lot of other people as Python has advanced in the last several revisions, Python 3.8 and 3.9 and now 3.10, they've been adding a lot of additional things to what we normally think of as just straight up syntax errors, where it's telling you more than just invalid syntax. <laughs> it's saying right. something like if you try to take something that's a keyword like none and assign something to none, it'll actually say you can't assign to a keyword that was in Python 3.7 and then 3.8, it actually says you can't assign a value to none. <laughs> right. It's going even more detailed into it, which is good. And that kind of explicitness is really going to inform you as you, you know, travel through your tracebacks. And this seems to be a real passion for uh, Andre. He actually has created a, a program that I wasn't familiar with, but has been featured a couple of times on Python Bytes. In fact, uh, it was featured on a really recent episode with um, Hannah Stepanek, former guest of ours, on there. And the tool that Andre created is called literally Friendly Tracebacks. Yeah. And it's sort of like a, you can, you know, do a, sort of a traceback reporting on your own code. Like you can run your .py file through it, or you can run it as a REPL to kind of do experiments and, and so forth. And inside that interactive REPL version of it, like I use one called bpython a lot, but it, in this one, it has these additional methods where you can actually say things like, why? <laughs> right. <laughs> with a, <laughs> and, you know, so why with a pair of uh, parentheses after it? And it'll actually then say, well, yeah, you can't actually do that to a list or you can't, you know, you know it'll actually give a, a nice verbose reasoning between things. And then it actually has a few other additional functions, you know, like I think what and why and. I think there's a where. Yeah, where, like, where did this happen? Yeah, it's, it's really neat. So it, it really dives deep into that. And again, for somebody wanting to learn more about the language and dive deeper into you know, interesting things that happen in syntax, or if you wanted to break apart a problem from your own code that was simply giving you a invalid syntax, you could find out more with it. So I'll include links to not only that, you know, along with the article. So I'm, I'm excited to play with it a little bit more. And so I had done a, a video course based on... Garana's cool new features in Python 3.8. And so I had learned a little bit more about this where there are actually warnings about dangerous syntax that were added to Python 3.8. And then they kind of keep adding on it. And in those cases, Python 3.8 had added a thing where if you were like trying to compare something and it really didn't make sense that you would be comparing these things, like, well, maybe you meant to type equal equals instead of is. Mm -hmm. um, and so these kind of ideas of that. And then Another one was this idea of like calling, like if you created a list of tuples, it's potential that if you forgot a comma in that, that it looks like you're trying to call the tuple that was just before it with, you know, again, some kind of arguments in it. And so it actually actually says tuple object is not callable with this little additional comment of perhaps you missed a comma. <laughs> yeah. Which is, again, super helpful stuff. So kind of going beyond that. And I really see this effort that's being put forth toward making this easier at the same time the complaint that the article dives pretty deep into is how type annotations can really sort of screw up a beginner and type annotations have some well some funky notation that you if you're not aware of it and you're kind of working through things and you make a mistake of using square brackets instead of using parentheses which is actually kind of an interesting thing since we have a <laughs> sort of a global crew at real python i've been running into sort of nomenclature issues with some of the video creators of them wanting to call everything brackets and right and 
brackets to them may just mean, you know, parentheses or round brackets versus square brackets. And so I could see, depending on where you are learning this as a beginner, that you might accidentally throw a pair of square brackets up in the case of something. And the example he gives is, is like, say you say, okay, I'm going to assign X. So X equals list, but instead of, you know, having a list inside of set of uh, parentheses, you were to put up square brackets. What you're doing by doing list and then square brackets, say one comma two comma three mm-hmm. and so forth, it is actually creating a generic alias type. It's basically s- sort of giving a type annotation to this thing. And so then if you start doing something to that, like you start to say, well, all right, well, give me what's at index two or you know, something like that, it will actually throw an error. And until you like do something like use the keyword type, and then throw your X inside of that, then it would say, oh yeah, you didn't make a list here. You've created this generic alias type. Right. And so it's kind of these, one of these things that we, I could see the confusion and I kind of understand it. I don't, it's, I guess it depends on the programming that you're doing. Normally I would think of the square brackets as being a standalone thing for creating a list, but I guess somebody could try to combine it because they might've seen someone use list with a pair of parentheses and, you know, with in, iterable inside of it. But anyway, so it's, it's one of these things and I can kind of see the push pull. I don't know where else you go syntactically to make these things so separate. His idea is, well, maybe you could just sort of blatantly say my program doesn't have type (laughs) types in it or something like that. Like kind of this weird flag or something like that maybe. And so it's interesting. And then it it devolved into a really advanced <laughs> conversation on hacker news that <laughs> goes on for a long time. Yeah. Um, talking about it. And, you know, some of it is real lots of sort of venting that people like to do. But of course, it's interesting to, to think about these things. And I, I appreciate what they're trying to do with type checking. And I, I have, you know, done my own course on it and been talking about it on here a few times. And, you know, definitely can see how you know, it adds all these advantages to things like working inside something like VS code and code completion and, you know, other kinds of checking and so forth and making sure your project makes sense to others and knows what kind of inputs it wants. So, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing that's happening. And so I don't know the answer, but it's, a, it's a good topic to kind of keep an eye on and, and think about. I don't know how often this mistake might come up and would screw up a beginner, but I don't feel like there's any kind of malicious intent behind any of that stuff. I think it's all sort of positive. Right. And I don't know if there's an easier way to define types than what, the, than what we've done. And, and I think we've already kind of passed a uh, very far the, past the f- initial stages to necessarily track back and try to change it again, but something to keep, keep in mind and definitely found a nice tool with friendly terse backs through it. Yeah, Definitely. F- friendly tracebacks is a really good, you know, if you do any like teaching, it's really, really good to have folks install that and, and they can, you know, they can learn more <laughs> and help them understand what's going on with, with the tracebacks. Or if you're just starting out learning, yeah, it's a, it's a really useful tool. It's a really cool project that, that Andre's put together. Yeah. And I'm definitely um, interested to see what else he writes on his blog. Cause it, it definitely, he likes to use lots of <laughs> examples throughout it. So it's not just like a wall of text. It's very easy to kind of go through and mm-hmm. uh, check out. It's a straight up blogger site in the old style too. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> With all the posts available, which is kind of funny, you know, so rare I see that anymore. Scout APM is application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues without dealing with the headache or overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. With a developer-centric UI and tracing logic that ties bottlenecks to source code, Scout pinpoints and resolves performance abnormalities like N plus one queries, memory bloat, and more. So you can spend less time debugging and more time building a great product. And with Scout's real-time alerting and weekly digest emails, you can rest easy knowing Scout's on watch to help you resolve performance issues before your customers ever see them. Better yet, at only $39 a month, Scout provides the insights you need in less than four minutes. Start your 14-day trial today. And as an added bonus for real Python listeners, Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. Go to scoutapm.com slash realpython.
So what do you got next? Yeah, the next thing I've got is a deep dive into how Python integers work. So there's a an author, Victor Skvortsov, who's been working on a series called Python Behind the Scenes. And he's been talking about, you know, just how how things work behind the scenes in Python. It's sort of like, uh, actually, there's there's some similarities to what uh, Brett Cannon has been doing with his, uh, what's he call it? The unraveling syntax. Unraveling, yeah. And, but it's, these are usually like, you know, a lot deeper dives, I would say, than uh, than what Brett has been been doing, but with a lot more kind of like theory and explanation uh, around it. But this week, the article he put out is called How Python Integers Work. It's kind of funny. I mean, you know, most people probably think the topic of like something like integers is pretty boring. But from a computer science perspective, it's actually really complicated and really, I mean, anything to do with numbers right. is, is very difficult to sort of represent on a computer. And so the issue with something like integers is that they don't have the same sort of precision problems that you run into with like floating point numbers and in these rounding errors and things like that. But integers are an infinite set of things and computers have finite memory. So because computers have finite memory, you can only store, I mean, you think of like representing a, a an integer as just a list of numbers, kind of like we do when we're writing it down, right? I mean, the the number 1000 is like a list of like starts with one and then has, you know, three zeros. So if you have some enormous number, then it's going to be very difficult to fit that into memory. So there's some techniques that you can do to reduce the amount of memory that an integer needs. And what Python does is use this technique or uh, this idea called a big num. And big nums represent numbers in a a large base. So rather than something like base 10, they represent it in like a base like two to the 15 or two to the 30 or like some some enormous base. And what that does is it means that numbers don't need to have that many digits. And you can you can represent really large numbers with with just a small amount of, of digits. Now you need sort of different things to represent each digit because it goes beyond just your standard like zero through nine. But but it, but the idea is that, you know, I can represent a really massive number with just like two or three digits and thereby saving a lot of uh, memory. You also get a lot of, you get faster addition and multiplication and things like that. And there's some algorithms that are used there that differ from sort of the standard addition and multiplication algorithms that you learn for base 10 numbers in school. But he gets into a lot of the details about, you know, what a big num is how it's implemented in C Python. So there's all sorts of, uh, you know, you, there's some C code in it. He's kind of diving into uh, that stuff. He gives some examples of of how the algorithms for arithmetic work. So you can really sort of understand like what is actually going on be- behind the scenes here. And he talks about, well, he compares C Python's big num imp- impl- implementation to other big num implementations. So there's, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of different, languages that use big nums. So it's not something that's like specific to Python or special about Python. Their implementation is not the only one. There are lots of them. And there's even sort of like third party implementations that you can use. There's one called the GNU Multiple Precision Arithmetic Library. And that has bindings for a lot of languages. So you could actually use that instead of the C Python implementation if you wanted to. And there's some advantages to that. But it gives a comparison of some benchmarks for arithmetic for C Python's big num implementation versus other languages. And it's pretty much kind of in the middle. He looks at 16 different languages from like Haskell all the way down to PHP. There's a whole bunch of them, Julia, Go, Dart, Lisp, Node.js, Java, Erlang, a whole bunch of these. Python is kind of in the top of the pack, not at, not at the very top, but but kind of, you know, higher middle. So it's, you know, it's a decent uh, implementation but there are ways that you could improve the performance if you need to. And then he also talks about some of the memory considerations that come with uh, with integers and and specifically when when dealing with arithmetic. If you get into arithmetic, some of these algorithms use recursion. And so there's an issue with with Python. It's anytime you you do perform an arithmetic operation, C Python creates a new integer object. So like when you like when you add, you know, 5 plus 2 
like let's say you have x and you assign x to the the integer five and then you you do something like you know x equals x plus two to add two to it well it's creating a whole new integer and assigning it assigning the name x back to that new integer it's not like manipulating the original right memory where you had five stored or anything like that so that can can potentially create some some memory issues and things like that but one of the things that uh, the C Python does to help with that is it actually pre-allocates some small integers that are just like they're there. And so if, if you create one of those, like it's already in memory, anytime you encounter that integer in your code, it's going to create a new reference to it in memory. So it's not having to to create new, for example, the number seven, if you if you create a literal seven in your program and then you create another one somewhere else you're going to get new references to that same number seven in, in memory and the range that they've got where they've they've pre-allocated these these integers goes from negative five up to 256 and the reason that they picked that range is because those are all the numbers that are used like in c python like that are that are created there so they're sort of optimizing for the ones that they use there and that's kind of why that that range exists but yeah it's just a big deep dive into how how this stuff really works on on computers and like i said it's you know you think like oh numbers i mean that's really simple kind of boring like integers aren't that that interesting although they really are even from a mathematical perspective <laughs> but uh, but you know from a computer science perspective you know handling anything with numbers on a computer is just really difficult and uh, it's just neat to see how some really smart people have uh, have decided to do that in C Python. Is that called captured smaller integers that are within that range? Is that the term that they use? Uh, I've heard the term interned. Interned. That's it. Not captured. Yeah. All right. So my next one, again, kind of builds on top of my conversation with Brett, which is kind of funny. The last three of them have been <laughs> kind of related in some ways to that. And the, in this case, it was talking about, uh, he mentioned that there was a new pep was looking like it might get approved and well this week it did yeah and so acceptance of pattern matching pep 634 uh, 635 and 636 so they've been accepted as as of uh, february 8th collectively this is called pattern matching if you've worked in another language where they've had case sort of switch statements it has some similarities to that though it has some other additional flexibility on top of that yeah, I don't want to go too deep into this topic, but what I think if you're interested in learning more about it, because, you know, it's going to be something that it still needs to be implemented in a lot of ways and they need to figure out exactly how it's going to kind of roll out in Python. It looks like it should be 310. Mm -hmm. What I suggest, because sometimes these are, these peps are hard for a beginner and even an intermediate to parse sometimes <laughs> all the things that are going on inside them. Yeah. You know, they're all the way up here in like 600 and, 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 and so forth. And so there's a lot of history and a lot of, you know, core developer sort of speak back and forth trying to explain. So again, PEP stand for Python enhancement proposal. Sometimes, trying, like I said, trying to dive into them can be a little confusing. So what I liked the PEP 636 is actually a tutorial that explains kind of how you might see this work. And I really thought it helped me a lot <laughs> kind of going into it, mm -hmm. giving you an idea of like, you know, what the code might look like in this case, this sort of set of matching sequences. And they used primarily as an example, the idea of like an old school text adventure, which I thought was really kind of cool. So they're like, yeah, you know, thinking about, okay, well, you know, if somebody you could type anything at a prompt, you know, you're standing in, in front of a tavern <laughs> whatever what do you want to do and so if somebody types potentially quit in that you could have a case for that you could have you know something like look and then it could be go and then it would also potentially have the ability to parse a direction out of that and so it it's you know matching potentially multiple values the idea of how a wild card works which i've heard some kind of complaints and back and forth the idea of the underscore acting as the wild card is a little different because I, I know that that's used in other circumstances when sometimes using iterables or uh, other places where you might see the yeah. underscore being used. I don't know I'm I'm excited to to play with this. I have used some other languages that have cases and you know sort of switch statements, and I can definitely find them to be useful. Right. 
So anyway, I've included not only the announcement from the list, but also um, some links to the PEPS itself and to that tutorial. If you'd like to learn a little more about it and dive into it, some news in the (laughs) upcoming version of Python. Yeah, this is one of those topics that created a lot of, just a lot of discussion, right? It was was sort of, I don't want to say it was a lot of controversy. I don't think it was quite on the level of something like the Walrus operator. Right. I mean, there's definitely a group of, I don't know what you want to call them, like Python purists out there that have kind of knee-jerk reactions to these sort of like, wow, you're really, this is like, it's really changing what Python is kind of a core, you know, yeah, like what, what Python is and everything, you know, but there's, there's a lot of, you know, arguments, you know, for and against and everything. I, I agree with the steering council that, uh, you know, overall it's a net positive for, for the language. It sort of modernizes it and brings it up to speed with a lot of other, I don't want to say competing languages, but, but this is something that, I mean, going back to just like a switch statement. I mean, that's something that I I feel like a lot of people felt was missing in Python in a lot of ways, you know, coming from other languages. You know, there there are times when, I mean, you can argue like, well, I mean, you can just use... Right. I mean, you could be buried in an if-lf tree. (laughs) So Right. But I, you know, but I think there are a lot of times when something like this, this switch case type syntax is, you know, clean and and, and nicer than than a, a, you know, big if-lf else kind of statement so so i think it's it's a net positive it does sort of open a lot of there's some really interesting discussion going on yeah uh, behind the scenes with with this stuff and it was really fascinating but i think overall it's going to be good it is something that like if you want to use this i mean you're going to have to upgrade to 3.10 and you know so there's and and then you know if you use this in your code it's not going to be backwards compatible right right this one won't yeah so this is, um, you know, this is something that that can can kind of be an issue, I guess. So it can, you know, we'll probably see slow adoption of it, just like we've seen, I think, with like uh, with the Walrus operator. I think that you know, it's that there's been sort of slow adoption of that, but, uh, but yeah, overall, I think it's a net a net positive. So yeah, I mean, you can look at the competing proposals that were in there and kind of see what other people were thinking about it, and, and definitely there's a large discussion <laughs> throughout. Yeah, a lot of discussion. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of adding something that isn't backward compatible is, yeah, I mean, those are decisions that (laughs) occasionally need to be made. It was interesting talking to Brad about just how he studies lots of other languages and tries to see, like, what our ideas were, you know, what could be potentially used in Python and how it might work and and so forth. So, yeah, cool. So, what's your next one? Uh, The next one I've got is another very mathematical one. So, it's... Kind of a theme <laughs> for the uh, for the day. It's a real Python article. It's called "Stochastic Gradient Descent Algorithm with Python and NumPy" by Mirko. Oh, I'm sorry, Mirko. I, I really need to learn how to pronounce his his last name. We'll have to get him on the show. <laughs> yeah, but but Mirko is he's done a lot of uh, these mathematical type articles for Real Python. We featured at least one, maybe not two of. Uh, or more of his articles. I know we talked about one about linear optimization with Python. So this is another sort of optimization type article. Stochastic gradient descent is a, it's an optimization algorithm for finding. So whenever you need to sort of like minimize or maximize a function, which is something again that you know comes up in business all the time. I mean, when you're when you're talking about trying to minimize costs for you know production or something like that. I mean these these optimiz- optimization techniques come up in a lot of different scenarios. And so if if you find yourself in working for a business, these are really good tools to have in your in your toolkit. Especially if you if you're in a position to sort of help senior level management make decisions and things like that. So now it also has lots of applications in machine learning. It's kind of a, a widely applicable topic. It's a very classic algorithm that dates back a long time. I mean, stochastic gradient descent has been used for a very, very long time, way before computers existed. It's, it's just a really tried and true algorithm for, uh, for optimization. Kind of the idea of it is you have some goal, usually called like the cost function, that you need to, kind of in the classical setup, you need to minimize this. So like you have a target cost for say uh, something you're producing and you have 
you know, the materials that go into it. And you want to sort of figure out how can I minimize the cost it takes to produce, you know, something like that. So you have these weights on on your variables that represent like the different materials or or something along those lines. And and you want to figure out, yeah, you just want to minimize that cost to, to produce it. This is one way to to figure that out. He talks about sort of the classic gradient descent, which is different from the stochastic gradient descent. He walks you through all that, explains all the math, gives you a little bit of a refresher from calculus in case you're not, in case it's been a while where you've seen these things, talking about like derivatives and, and things like that. It gives a really nice intuition for what gradient descent really is. And that is you can imagine that, let's say you have a cone and the bottom of the cone is sort of like that, it's that minimum, right? You want to reach that minimum and you want to find the path of least resistance to get there along along the cone. So you're like a little ball at the top of this cone, like what's the path of least resistance to get down there? So that's what the gradient descent algorithm does is it finds that that sort of most efficient path to get down to the bottom to find that uh, that minimum because you don't know what that minimum is. So that's kind of what this gradient descent algorithm is is doing for you. It's an iterative process where each step you kind of find like which direction to go that has like the most, like the highest rate of change in the in the right direction. And you just keep going down and, and it, it, you, you build up momentum and everything to like more quickly get down to that, to that bottom. So it gives a really nice intuition behind what's going on. It walks you through building a gradient descent algorithm from scratch in Python. And then he gets into talking about what the stochastic gradient descent algorithm is, which is a little bit different because you're looking at sort of random samples of these observations, which is like, so if, if you imagine like the cone example, right, you're a ball at the edge of a cone and you're trying to find the, the a path of least resistance down to the bottom, you, you know, in the, in the, in the classic algorithm, you have to look at like every direction. It's kind of like, well, <laughs> I mean, there could be like an infinite number of directions, right? So like, how do you, there's a lot of data there to, to sort of process and find like which direction offers the most, like the, the highest rate of change in the direction I, I know that I, I want to go. Whereas stochastic gradient descent is going to take sort of a random sample and just pick, you know, out of that sample, pick that. So, so it's a little bit different approach there. And there's some variations that he talks about online stochastic gradient descent, batch stochastic gradient descent, and talks about what those are, how to implement them. He goes through some implementations by scratch, but then he also gets into how to do it using Kira's and TensorFlow and wraps it up with some uh, some examples for you to look at where you could apply this stuff. So yeah, so if you're, in, if you're into these kind of optimization problems and interested in uh, like kind of how machine learning works kind of under the hood in a lot of a lot of cases, then it's a really thorough and, uh, and great article to, to check out. You'll learn a lot from it. It makes me think about this role that when I was, you know, in my last transition for jobs I was looking at and the role kept coming up called business analyst. And it kind of takes yeah. this idea of, okay, well, there's the data scientist role which doesn't necessarily involve the part with advice. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you're like, you're analyzing things and you're looking at things, but you're sort of like presenting the results. Whereas the business analyst is maybe is also adding on top of that to, to say, well, actually, you know, I think we should do this next, <laughs> you know? Right. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. And it's titled Simulating Real World Processes in Python with SimPy. The course is based on a real Python article by Jaya Jeanne. And in the course, Joe Tatusco takes you through setting up a simulation of a business and how to use the SimPy framework to optimize resources. Through the course, you learn how to use a simulation to model a real world process, create a step by step algorithm to approximate a complex system, and design and run a real world simulation in Python with SimPy. If you're interested in data science and want to explore creating simulations to resolve issues that modern businesses and complex systems face, this is a great course to get you started. And like most of the video courses on RealPython, the video is broken into easily consumable sections and has code samples for the techniques shown. It also has a shiny new transcript and captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So I'm going to break away and let's talk to Martin Broyce about his recent article 
Hey, Martin. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Good to be back. Yeah, it's good to hear your voice again. And I was wondering how the program that we talked about, your stay-at-home mentorship program, it's, gosh, not almost a year, but close. Well, it went really well. It's currently not going anymore. We kind of, yeah, we really didn't know how long this whole pandemic was going to go. I mean, it's still going on, but we kind of started it off as a two-month thing where we just wanted to give people a, a, a start into coding with together with a mentor. And it went really well. Like we, we ended up continuing the program well into July, I think. So it, it kept going for at least half a year, I would say, or pretty much half a year. Nice. Yeah, we, we managed to connect a lot of learners with volunteer mentors, essentially. So there were we had like 60, more than 60 mentors sign up and we had more than 100 people sign up. And we, yeah, we managed to connect them together over all sorts of different tech stacks, you know, like from over Python, Java, which is the courses that we also have and that we gave the people access to, but also other things like people were doing some data science, people were doing um, a different programming languages that I guess I didn't even know about that they were going on. <laughs> but it was, it, it was a big effort to, to just find this, you know, like find the right mentor for the right person and kind of like make a good match. And there was a lot of a lot of manual work involved on our end to uh, to just like make sure that the people were in the right time zones and that they would actually match on the skills that they have to offer and the skills that are interested in learning. And yeah, I wrote a little Django app uh, with a Django REST framework thing, so we would have an API and a, and an admin where we can kind of figure out who who goes well with whom. Nice. And yeah, that's that's kind of how we were doing the matching. But yeah, it turned it turned out really well. We got oh, we cool. got lots of positive feedback. We we got to know a bunch of very motivated mentors and students, and we're still hearing back from some people that are still meeting up and getting success stories of students finding a job. And just a couple of days ago, someone that was uh, mentioned that someone got a job at Capital One, one of our the students that that went through our program there. So oh wow, yeah, it was really awesome. A good it was it was a big effort, but it feels like it was a nice small contribution to the messy situation that was going on. So yeah, I'm happy that it turned out well. Okay, great. The other reason I wanted to have you come on is you recently wrote another article. In this case, it's a little different experience in the sense that it was an existing article that was on RealPython mm -hmm. about using Python, you know, kind of updating this Python web applications deploy your script as a Flask app. Mm -hmm. And partly I want to talk about the experience of updating it, but also... Uh, maybe we could start off and, and kind of go through some of the things that someone will learn as they go through this process of going through the article. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was an interesting process to update it. The, the article was out of date because it's been written, I think, more than three years ago. And, you know, I think it's five years ago. Five years I saw ago comments even. that were okay. like five years. Yeah. Which is a lot in technology years. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it was an old art article. And I'm sure like it was, it, I'm sure it was good back then but there were a lot of changes you know you know both in the style guides of like what we consider to be good articles as well as also just in the technology like google app, app engine completely changed since then I, when i started working on the article i tried to get it to run myself and <laughs> it ran into so many <laughs> problems that it had where just for example it used to use something called web app 2 uh, as a framework essentially to deploy any python code that's what google app engine used i guess five years ago and they completely retired it. So this, this doesn't exist anymore in a Python 3 environment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, I had to restructure the article a lot because it was just built on, on an outdated tech stack, so to say. But now it's, it's using Flask uh, because Google App Engine changed over to using existing Python frameworks. Oh, okay. Flask as a micro framework seemed like a good choice, just as the simplest one to set up. Yeah, it's, it's not hard to stand up you know, on like your own local machine of simple Flask app just to be able to, you know, sort of hit it at the local host. Right. In this case, going through, just looking at it, it seems like those initial steps are not drastically different, but the big part of it is really getting into, you know, picking a hosting provider. In this case, it's Google. Mm -hmm. And then sort of creating all the sort of backend sort of stuff of like, okay, how do I create my account and, get it all set up to be able to just accept my code <laughs> and be, be be hosted. So I feel like you go through a lot of that in detail. Yeah, it's a pretty... So, you know, the kind of the idea I had when I was rework working this article was really 
to like approach this how do you deploy some code uh, on the web um, from a different angle because there's I've seen so many tutorials to tell you how to build a Flask app or how to build a Django app that really start off from the beginning with the idea that you want to build a web app, right? Yeah. But in my experience teaching also, like this is not necessarily how you start off and unless you really want to go into web development and you know this right from the start. But if you're just learning programming, what you do at the beginning is you write a couple of scripts locally and you get something to run, you know? Yeah. And then it's quite a, um, you know, it's, I wanted to kind of like bridge this gap between you have the scripts on your local machine and then uh, how can, how, like, what's the steps that you need to do so that these scripts essentially run on the web? So it's, you, you didn't set out to build a web app, right? But you have some useful code and you want to make it available to a lot of people over the web and some steps on how, how can you do that actually? Like, how can you run your Python code on the web that, that wasn't intended to be on the web essentially? <laughs> it seems like that's the big deal, right? Like, you know, I had a, uh, article we talked about last week about creating a dashboard kind of tool with, or I guess it was a couple of weeks ago with Dash mm-hmm. and Plotly. And, you know, the idea of being able to show your work to others really is that extra step as opposed to like hauling somebody over and sitting them in a chair in a computer next to you and saying, Hey, I built this thing. Right. You know, the idea <laughs> of putting it up on the web is really that extra step, but it's so complicated. It is. Yeah, it's it's really complex to get anything up on the web because there's so much additional stuff that runs into it. You know, you need to understand stuff about HTTP requests. You need to understand something about server setup. You need to understand HTML and CSS if you want to style it a little bit. And uh, yeah. the whole deployment process is super complicated generally. And it's it's kind of, yeah, so with, with the article, I was just trying to give some sort of an an, an approach to how can you do this uh, without needing to worry too much about um, you know all of these other aspects that go into web development. Really, just with the main focus of I have this code that is useful. I want to show it to someone over the web, and what's really necessary to be done for that. Yeah. So the big part of it for you is like deciding if you wanted to stay with Google, probably as far as a hosting platform, and then beyond that taking everybody through that interface and mm-hmm. and getting them familiar with it like it's different you're not teaching python per se at that point you know you're you're teaching um other <laughs> sort of uh hosting skills yes. or whatever you want to call them <laughs> you know uh dev ops almost not totally but somewhat yeah yeah that's correct it's uh, it's much more about uh, much more about these other aspects yeah deployment i guess than than actually building um, uh, we're also providing the code for that's still from the old article a temperature converter uh, as a script you know because you're starting off with a script so the, really writing the app is not really the main focus but yeah as you said the changes the DevOps style type of changes changes that you need to do to, to run it in a completely different environment essentially Were there big stumbling blocks in the process? What's kind of hard if you're working with uh, an existing article is that you know how much do you change and how much do you keep in there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this type of decision, <laughs> especially because there's uh, a lot of the tech was outdated. So I had, I had to rework it, but I, I could have chosen a different deployment platform. There's Heroku. There's a couple of completely free ones that, that allow you to deploy your code as well. Yeah. You mentioned Python Anywhere was another one, right? Right. Yeah. And Google App Engine is free if you use it in this uh, uh, below a certain quota. So it's, it's a good choice too. Yeah. So, so I wanted to keep because it was just meant to be an update. So I wanted to keep as much as possible of the original idea of the article. But yeah, it it, it really spiraled a little, um, <laughs> exploded in, in size and became a very, very long article <laughs> that kind of approaches the whole topic from a slightly different point. Yeah, but I think it's good that you're you're able to kind of focus on that to, to you know, hold somebody's hand through that process of, mm-hmm. of stuff that they're going to be... W- well, generally less familiar with, and hopefully on the other side of it, there's a lot of similarity in these platforms. A lot of them all have you know some sort of control panel and right, um, you know, account management and that sort of stuff. And then generally, then you're still like, okay, what is this sort of thing that I'm hosting? You know, is it a machine? Or is it a container? And you know, all these kinds of different uh, other DevOps kinds of topics. So. Totally, yeah, yeah. I always say this to like students. It's like when you when you learn one of these big uh, deployment platforms or cloud providers, you kind of, it's going to be much easier to find your way around the other ones. So it's just going through the process. It's like, like always, if, you, if you've done it one time, <laughs> it just gets yeah. easier the other times, even if it's slightly different in AWS or, or on Azure or something. 
And you do something else besides the temperature converter. You, you create a couple other like ways that you could convert the code and and do a little more kind of generic HTML stuff with it. It's not all about style. Yeah, which was different with the the plotly dash thing. Mm-hmm. It actually focused a little more on that, which is interesting. But hopefully, you know, <laughs> if you can get your Python code running, <laughs> you know, you can kind of put whatever you want up there, which is really cool. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to keep the HTML as minimal as possible. Like there's a there's a whole API version of the temperature converter where you can input the the numbers in the URL oh, yeah. and then convert it like that where you really need zero HTML for it. But as, lo- as soon as you want to have any sort of front end, you know, like an, an input box or something, you're gonna need just a bit of HTML, and yeah, it's it's really minimal in there because I didn't want it to want to make it to focus. I think it's a great resource for anybody wanting to get started on that stuff. So I think cool really help them. Were there other considerations as you went through it that sort of surprised you as you're working through the article? <laughs> That's more a personal thing, but uh, what keeps surprising me is how long stuff gets when I start writing on them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's something I personally have to deal with, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, we have a few authors that 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 happens with. Where we're like, well, I need to talk about this too. Yes, and they really need to understand this. And I do the same thing with video courses, and they sort of um, expound uh, drastically. And <laughs> I think it's important, but you know, maybe there should be somebody else behind me tapping on the shoulder saying, "There should be a stopping point where you need to release this." <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's a nice thing also, like writing with real Python is that there's always like a team behind it. And I, I did get I, I did get feedback from the from the other contributors that I mentioned in the article that helped me a lot where they were like, this may be, you know, the whole process of even making it better, but also being like, maybe don't don't continue writing. <laughs> it's, it's getting a bit <laughs> too, too big there. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, cool. Thanks for coming on the show again. And yeah, happy to. I, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing and glad to hear the mentorship program went so well. And let me know if you're going to do something like that in the future and we'll let people know about that here. Definitely. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's still, the pandemic is still going on. So yes, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm sure we could still help, but it was very, very overwhelming to see like how much support, how many, how many people were ready to to give some of their time to, to help out someone in the situation. It was really nice to see. Yeah. Would be lovely to do something like that again. Just it's a neat, neat part of a uh, humanity to get to see that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, that brings us to to projects. And my first project, it's kind of funny. We've got three sort of core concepts this week of math and the internal workings of Python, but then also web <laughs> uh, projects. And yeah. So kind of following up after talking about Flask. This project is called Django Unicorn, and the subtitle is A Magical Full Stack Framework for Django. The idea is this person, which I've I mentioned this frustration before, of trying to learn, gosh, you know, all the different things that are inside of JavaScript these days. And the idea of like trying to add all those JavaScript frameworks to Python really adds like a lot of extra complexity and then also you know, just having to really understand what are all the tools that are there in the very fast moving world of, of JavaScript. Yeah. What if you could do a lot of that sort of functionality just right inside of Django? And so the idea of adding sort of modern site functionality where you can quickly have like interactions right inside of a view without it having to like dive through lots of different layers or potentially you know, go in and out of a database and the idea of building sort of not having to actually build an API <laughs> with like serializers and so forth and just write it in Django. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And I watched some of the tutorials on it. I didn't really have a chance to dive real deep into setting it all up myself, but I, I feel like within like a half an hour, I could be up and playing around with it. And the examples are pretty slick. Like again, there's screencasts. It's a pretty young project, but I can see the advantages if you want to add some functionality to your Django site without having to glue on a lot of other stuff. The idea that you could actually do a bit more development and and kind of give the front end a a little bit more on top of it. And I like, again, the examples, like it has like, you know, creating a to-do task list, like right on front of it, a character counter, some different search things, validation, kind of going back to the idea of like text that can be entered on sites. Uh, And you get to kind of play with them. And so you can obviously see 
uh, this sort of Django example running with all these sort of toys uh, on top of it and the source code right, right below it. So something to check out if you don't want to learn a whole new templating language and you'd like to maybe stay inside the Django universe and kind of build on top of it. You know, I really see the advantages of Django from, you know, the idea of not having to create a whole user management model or an administration kind of thing. Um, but you may want some additional features on top of it. Mm -hmm. This is a really neat project. So check it out. So what do you got? Yeah. So the project I've got this week is called math inspector sticking with uh, my math theme for the, for the week. And it's, it's called a, a visual programming environment for scientific computing. It's a really interesting project. So it comes with like a Python REPL that provides some additional features like uh, syntax highlighting, you know, similar to like what like BPython does or IPython. So it does, it's not like IPython where it has like the, the different cells and stuff. It sort of looks more like the traditional Python REPL. But like when you open it up, you, you don't type Python, you open it up. I don't sure what the command is, probably, you know, math inspector or something like that. But it, it says like math inspector as opposed to C Python or, or whatever. And it's got some, uh, some nice things. So it, it has uh, syntax highlighting. It includes lots of hotkeys, things like that. It has a lot of built-in plotting functionality for interactive plots. So it's capable of plotting things like parametric curves, algebraic varieties, fractals, curved surfaces, 2D and 3D. All that comes built in without having to install anything extra. It also provides a really interesting way to interact with uh, Python functions and objects without coding in sort of like this block coding, like no code kind of format. Yeah, it's like a flow chart. Some other tools I've seen for video. Right. Where you're like layering all these different elements of video together. You know, like maybe you have something that's a green screen and then you're layering this other layer and so forth. And mm -hmm. I've seen this sort of interface before like that where you're like sort of it's very nodal. Yes. You're sort of gl gluing all these pieces together. It's cool. Yeah, exactly. Which can be an interesting way to interact with with that, especially if like if, if you don't know a lot about code or, or coding. So it kind of provides you a way to sort of visually interact with that stuff. Uh, you know, this is really meant as a tool, I think, for like uh, teachers yeah. or, or possibly even, you know, researchers, you know, just as, as a, um, a way to sort of code up some some ideas and uh, or even, you know, using this block coding idea without having to code. It has a uh, animation capability, so it can render anima animations for like educational content creators. So math teachers and professors that want to generate some interesting uh, things there. It's got a built-in object debugger, a module explorer, so you can see everything that's there. It has a built-in documentation browser. You can export projects so that you can share them with other people uh, if you want to. So it's a really, you know, cool tool for for people that want to. For really, I think you know, I, I really think mathematics teachers at sort of like the, the introductory college level is kind of like the target here. It's kind of the sense that I that I get from it. But it's a really way, I mean, programming in math is something that I think it'd be nice if there was more integration of those two things in the mathematics curriculum, because I think programming provides a really concrete way to sort of yeah. understand some of these concepts in, in mathematics. And this looks like a really neat tool to be able to, to do that. And that also is free and has, uh, because it's, you know, centered on python it doesn't have quite as steep of a learning curve as something like matlab uh, does or something like that it's also a lot less money so and then the other cool thing about it is it's entirely open source so it's a really you know if, if you just want to see how they built this thing i mean you can just go into github and, and take a look at it it's a really well organized repository so it's very easy to navigate and kind of uh, see what's going on there's a lot of uh, documentation so you know, I just, as I was like scrolling through the code and looking at it, it's, it's very, very well written code and a great project to check out as well to see like how they're, you know, how they're doing all these, uh, all these things. So uh, really good stuff. Yeah. I like the quote that they have in the middle of the page uh, near the bottom. If watching math videos is like going to the movies instead of reading a book, then math inspector is like playing a video game instead of doing your homework. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that's, you know, somebody coming from like this math perspective, but I think this is the the area of math where I really would have 
I think it would have kept me more in it. This sort of like standalone study and being able to see stuff visually, um, the idea of like, okay, let's talk about tangents. Let's talk about sine. Let's talk about cosine and, and be able to see those things and then interact with them would be way more interesting to me. And I, right. I think that that level kind of adds on top of it. Of course, you know, there's all these great YouTube videos, which they're kind of alluding to there of, you know, instead of reading a book to be able to do that. But the idea of interacting with it, I think is another additional kind of fun level. So yeah, maybe it'll get me back into playing with math a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Thanks for coming on the show again and uh, bringing all the articles. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, we'll see you soon. Yep. Sounds good. See you later. Don't forget, start your 14 day trial today with Scout APM. And as an added bonus for Real Python listeners, Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. I want to thank Martin Broyce and David Amos for coming on the show again. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.